So today we're going to be talking about New England's changing forests over time. And we have as our speaker, Dr. Jonathan Thompson. He's a senior ecologist at the Harvard Forest, which is a department of Harvard University. His research focuses on long-term and broad scale changes in forest ecosystems with an emphasis on quantifying how land use, including harvest, conservation, and land protection, um, all affect forest ecosystem processes and services. So I want to welcome you, Jonathan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Catherine. It is my pleasure. I really appreciate everybody showing up for their lunch break and spending it on Zoom when you could be outside in the sun. I, I appreciate it. I hope I can make it interesting for you. Um, I have asked Catherine, because I can't look at the chat while I talk. I'm just not that talented. Um, so we're going to, Catherine's going to monitor the chat. And if ever you like need me to stop to explain something or clarify something, she can holler. Uh, I won't be reading it. Otherwise, we'll save questions for afterwards. I hope my talk goes about 45 minutes and we got about 15 minutes to talk before the hour, but I'm happy to stay a little later if there are more questions or anything uh, like that. So yeah, I'm Jonathan Thompson. I uh, am trained as an ecologist and, and a forester, and I have a, another degree in policy. Uh, I started out in this business like most ecologists because I like to be in the woods and I like to um, spend time outside, but through time, the questions I was interested in got bigger in scale and bigger in time frame. And these days it is uh, only pretty rare that I'm able to sneak outside and measure a tree. These days I use a lot of remote sensing and big databases and simulation models. And so uh, with all those tools, I think about the New England land system. I think about the way that people uh, relate to land, that how the decisions they make about land affect them and how it affects uh, the forests themselves. I work at the Harvard Forest. I hope many of you have been there. It is what we think of as the outdoor uh, laboratory and classroom for Harvard University. We own about 4,000 acres in Peter Sam, Massachusetts in Worcester County. And um, as you can see in this picture, we measure the heck out of the forest and we manipulate it as well. It's arguably the most measured forest in the world. We, we make that claim knowing that it would be hard to dispute it. Uh, but you can see um, kind of an interesting picture right there in the middle at the bottom. That is our long-term soil warming experiment where for more than 30 years now, we have been experimentally raising the temperature of the soil by five degrees above ambient temperature to look at how it affects the microbial communities and its ability to store carbon and cycle nutrients. And that's just one example. You can see over on the right, Andrew and Megan up at the top of one of our many towers, which are uh, measuring fluxes of carbon in and out of the uh, forest and atmosphere several times a second. We run a uh, undergraduate student program every summer where about 25 kids come out, students, undergraduate students. I'm getting old that I call them kids. But um, come out and you can see an example there in the bottom where they are measuring trees. In the bottom left there, uh, she's measuring one of the trees in our long-term forest dynamics plots, these, which consists of about 145,000 individual stems that we remeasure, map, and uh, tag every five years. And on the lower right there, it looks like some soil respiration. So, we also have hundreds of miles of trails, a museum that sadly is still closed because of the pandemic, but uh, lots of trails that are open to the public and I really encourage you to come. As I said, we're located here in central uh, Massachusetts in South Central New England, which um, I think of as a really important place to understand forests and I hope I can make my case for that as we move along here. Um, but before we go much further, I just want to take a moment and, you know, 
talk about something that I've been thinking more about, and then I know a lot of others at Harvard Forest and else have been thinking about, and just reflect that this piece of Earth that we've dedicated ourselves to understanding was for millennia uh, home of the Nipmuc people. Uh, they uh, are are remain on the landscape and are in part of our community. As a team of researchers at the Harvard Forest, we're dedicated to understanding this land and the land use and the coupled relationships between people and land. And the salient fact that the Nipmuc have been on this land for millennia is often not part of the conversation. So uh, we're looking to make that more part of the conversation. You know, as we talk about the region throughout New England, we can see it's the Worcester County was the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc people, but that there are a lot of um, tribal lands throughout the region, all part of the Algonquin language. They share a somewhat similar language and culture. And if you've seen me or basically anybody at the Harvard Forest give a talk in the past 30 years, it probably started with this figure. Um, it's an important figure. It shows the steep decline of forest cover across the region associated with European colonization, followed by 150 years of natural forest recovery. Uh, and we'll talk more about this figure. It's a critical figure for understanding the mono, modern context for New England forest. But as I show this figure over and over, I begin to worry and wonder if I'm giving the impression that this is somehow the beginning that this is the start of the story about people in forests on this land. And of course that's not true. We all know that's not true, I hope we do. Um, New England has been a peopled landscape for thousands of years, but we Western scientists don't talk about that much. And there are some notable exceptions, but they are vanishingly rare in comparison. So the Harvard Forest and our uh, e ecological research program are, uh, see this as an obligation to do better. And because as by erasing the history, which is an incredibly uncomfortable history, we're missing most of the story of this land. And so uh, we're trying to work more with the Nipmuc people because of course, they're not just part of the past of this landscape, they're part of its present and future as well. And trying to do a better job of acknowledging the, the full history and working, more importantly, working to build relationships with the Nipmuc community. So um, that said, because my research is largely on modern land use regimes and uh, the effect of large scale land cover change, we, we do begin the depth of our story with the colonial land use history. So here we are back to this figure that uh, I just showed before, which as I said, is just critical for understanding the modern condition of our forest. You can see that um, prior to colonialization, the land was almost completely forest cover, best we can tell. And this declined as the land was cleared for farming and woodlots and grazing until in about 1850, about the time Thoreau was writing Walden and Concord just down the road from the Harvard Forest, you know, he, he'd never seen a deer. He, Emerson's grandmother had, and he'd heard it through uh, fable that there might have been some deer, but it couldn't fathom a landscape that was as forested as it once was, nor I expect could he fathom where it would be 150 years hence. Because as the economy changed, mostly as modes of transportation changed, the ability to move food to urban centers and not be such a agrarian economy tied to the land, there was this massive period of 150 years of reforestation, natural reforestation. You know, in many ways, I think of this as just this incredible um, second chance, you know, all this forest return, the resilience of the landscape, but it's just through, you know, dumb luck, really, the accidents of history that we got this chance. And here we are, if we look at the other states, particularly the southern New England, they follow a very similar pattern, somewhat more muted in the northern states in terms of that rate of forest decline but overall a pretty similar story throughout New England. 
And so um, the other big noticeable thing about this figure is there sometime between 1950 and 2000, the, the, all these lines turn again towards deforestation. And this, I think of this as a much harder deforestation. A, um, this is, and we'll talk in detail about this, but this is residential development, commercial development, and uh, a lot of other permanent forest loss. So I'm gonna start by talking here about the recovery of forest cover. We'll talk a little bit about composition and then growth in the forest before we get into the modern land use regime. Normally I would ask everybody if they've ever heard of a witness tree and then I sort of judge if they, you know, how many folks nod, but I can't see you. I'm just talking at my laptop here. So assuming that you don't know what a witness tree is, I'll tell you, um, and I wish you could hear it from this gentleman, Charlie Cogbill, who's a colleague of mine. He is an environmentalist and uh, an ecologist and a historian. Witness trees are the record of property boundaries at the time of colonization. And in addition to maybe a rock cairn, the surveyors would write down a number of trees, trees that were um, reliable distances from the rock cairn because people are not to be trusted and they will move those rocks. Trees are much harder to move. And so if you write down yield oak, yield maple and put it at the corner of the property, it's a stable property boundary. Well, Charlie spent much of his career in the basements of town halls throughout New England, writing down every time uh, he saw a property record associated with a tree species. Uh, here's an example of that type of uh, property record and the way you would extract the tree species from that. Well, eventually he had accumulated 338,000 individual mentions of trees. And this is really the only only record we have of its type that can tell us what the pre-colonization tree species were at this granularity. Now they're not research grade data and frustratingly for me they often can just be brought down to genus and not species and for some genus like maple that's problematic because red maple is so ecologically different than sugar maple but still it's a treasure trove of data so i worked with charlie and this was the figure uh susan uh put up in advance of this talk to compare those 38 tree species to the modern inventory so on the left, you have Charlie's data, and on the right, you have the forest inventory and analysis data. We tried to resample those modern data in a way that would sort of emulate the, um, the way that the witness trees were sampled. So again, normally it's fun to sort of ask you what you see, but I'll tell you what comes to, uh, pops out at me first is, one is, all the oaks, those sort of brown color down in the south, right? You don't see those in the modern data nearly as abundant. And the beach throughout the northern hardwood zone of Vermont in particular, but throughout um, New Hampshire and Vermont in particular. And both the oaks and the beach have been replaced by uh, maple. And because the modern data ha do have species information, not just genus, I can tell you that that is overwhelmingly red maple. Red maple is kind of like, I think of the raccoon of tree species. It's a generalist. It does pretty well where humans are. It doesn't mind it if it's a little wet or a little dry or a little shady or a little bright. And it comes in pretty well after disturbances. And so right now we have, that is the most abundant stem in the New England landscape. The last thing I take from this, well, two more things. One is that the modern data just looks kind of smeared over compared to the sort of clustering you have with the witness tree, right? And this, this comes from time. This is the settling out, the species getting tightly coupled to the climatic and edaphic conditions of New England. And I think if we could all just magically disappear and take with us our invasive insects and uh, climate change and the like, the forest would return to this sort of more clustered feel. And the other thing, the last thing, and it's related, is that if you look really close, you'd see that there's only one species missing from the right that was on the left. 
and that's chestnut. And that to me is remarkable because if you put someone from the pre-colonial period, a, 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 a Nipmuc tribal member down and she looked around, she would largely recognize the forest, right? All but chestnut, all the species remain. Yes, the relative abundance has changed. And to me, that's hopeful. So that while the relative abundance of tree species has really changed, almost all the native species remain and they recovered naturally. And to me, that's a testament to the real resilience of this landscape. If you stop mowing your lawn, you get a forest. That's not true everywhere. And that's a real uh, blessing for New England. So, okay, we talked about forest cover and we talked a little bit about forest composition. Now I wanna talk about forest growth. Forest growth, I think of in terms of carbon, right? We know photosynthesis is a way that plants fix or basically absorb carbon from the atmosphere and store it in their tissues, right? And so that's why everybody wants reforestation to curb climate change, right? Because as you look out on the forest, if you were to take those trees, dry them out in an oven and then measure them, you'd find out that they're 50% carbon more or less. And so this is a tremendous asset to us as we pump tons and tons of fossilized plant tissue into the atmosphere. And those are fossil fuels, right? And so as the forests recover from the colonial land use period, they continue to sequester carbon. And what you see here in this green thick line is our, uh, we call it the EMS tower, the Environmental Measurement Station. It is a eddy flux tower, which is a really um, sophisticated way to measure the movement of carbon from the atmosphere into the forest about six times per second. And we've been doing that actually since 1988, but this figure, we changed how we did it in 92. So this figure shows it starting in 92. Uh, Harvard prof professor Steve Wofsey built this tower. Until that time, they had only been used in agricultural environments. He said when he built it, he didn't know if it'd still be standing the next day. And here it is, like 35 years later, there's at least 1,700 such towers in North America alone, really built on the model of this first one that's still running at the Harvard Forest. When Steve built this tower and you asked, if you would ask Steve or any of the ecologists associated with it at the time, what this graph would look like in 2020 or 2016, as this graph goes up to, he would have told you he thought it'd be about flat. And that was the conventional wisdom at the time, that the forest had reached an age where decomposition in the forest and forest respiration roughly offset forest growth. And that we had kind of, the, the way we would say it is the carbon sink was full for these forests. And we know eventually that will happen. They're not redwoods after all. They're not just gonna grow and grow and grow and be uh, forever. But what kind of knocks me out is that I, I probably, I think I work with some of the smartest forest scientists in the world. And if you were to ask them, when is that line gonna stop going up? They wouldn't agree. Or if they were honest, they would just say, you know, I don't know. And so here it is, the most studied forest in the world, the smartest folks around looking at it and we don't know. And who cares? Well, we all care because right now that represents about the equivalent of 16% of our fossil fuel emissions are being brought into the forest. This is like the prototypical ecosystem service, right? If this stops, our pollution gets that much worse in terms of carbon pollution that causes climate change, right? So that goes up and down like that. The little sawtooth, that just shows the seasonality, leaves on, leaves off. Um, and you can see that's different than the blue one. What's the blue one? The blue one is in the hemlock tower, is the hemlock tower in a hemlock stand. We put that one up in 2005. That's the only reason it's shifted to the right like that. It's just when we built the tower. And you can see for the first you know, uh, 10 years or so, hemlocks are growing at about the same pace as the hardwoods that are underneath the EMS tower. But then it starts to curve down. So what's going on there? That's the hemlock woolly adelgid. And so that's an aphid-like insect that uh, has invaded North America and is slowly killing the hemlock. And 
There are now, it seems to me, uh, an insect for just about every tree species in our forest. It, it is uh, truly troubling and only getting worse. Uh, we can talk about that afterwards. I think a lot about forest uh, insects and pathogens, but we don't have time for that today. So I'll talk about this red uh, line, which uh, Chris Williams built this tower. He's a Clark University professor. And he put this re up right after we clear cut a spruce um, plantation on the Harvard forest. And this to me is super interesting because at first you can see that red line goes down. And what's going on there? That's the decomposition of all the, the roots, the slash, and the soil as it's now warmed up and in the sun, right? And what's decomposition except photosynthesis in reverse? So rather than carbon going into the forest, it's coming out of the forest and going back into the atmosphere. But it only took about four years before that red line U-turns and heads uh, north again or up again. And that's as in this case, it was a whole bunch of pin cherry. It became kind of a, a misery to walk through to get to that tower. But, uh, you know, and again, that's natural reforestation. And by about 10 years, it had reached the point that it was when he built the tower and he took the tower down. So we haven't been following it since. But again, this to me is this, this real testament to the resilience of New England forest, right? That it was only a few years before natural reforestation came in and the stand was uh, sequestering carbon again. Okay. So that's what I'm going to talk about as far as the history before we go on to the modern land use regime, but a, a few takeaways from that section. One is that forest expansion has peaked, right? That's the first graph that we saw. The, the lines are now headed south again. We are losing forest on net. Native tree species dominate, but their relative abundance is totally different than it was in the colonial period. Forests are still growing, recovering from that colonial land use period, and there's no end in sight. Or maybe there is, we don't know. And that past land use has this persistent legacy in modern forests. So as you walk around and take these hikes uh, over the next few weeks and you see the landscape just you know, threaded by forest, uh, by rock wall, stone walls, just remember, nobody ever built a stone wall in the middle of a forest, right? That's a testament to what used to be here, that the, this used to be a open landscape and the forests you've seen have re recovered since then. So let's shift then and talk about the modern land use regime and what's driving change in modern New England forest. It's not climate change. I, I only say this because I think uh, we are rightfully hearing a lot about climate change and their impacts on forests particularly in the Western US where forests, uh, where droughts and unprecedented wildfires are really transforming the forest. In New England though, the story is a little different. It is getting warmer, it is getting wetter, but if you're a tree and it's getting a little warmer and a little wetter and there's a little more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, so far, that's not so bad. You're okay with that as a tree. And so that's not the thing I'm most worried about. Climate change is exacerbating pests and pathogens, and there are, is reason for concern, but it's not the number one issue that's driving change. It's still land use. New England is home to more than 15 million people and more than 15 million hectares of forests, which is kind of remarkable when you think about it. It is to me anyway. Uh, one of my mentors, Dave Kittredge, used to always say that New England is a place with trees in the overstory and people in the understory. And I think that's true. And you really can't understand the forests of New England unless you understand people's relationship to those forests because they're just everywhere throughout it. New England is, uh, uh, you know, I, I was trained in Oregon and did all my work there. And I was working there during the Spotted Owl uh, Wars. And, you know, Judge Dwyer shut down with a stroke of the pen harvesting on you know 12 million acres of Pacific Northwest forest because it was federally owned and one person could change forest policy just overnight. You can't do that here. Uh, the our forests are largely owned by family forest owners with a pretty big chunk owned by corporate owners in the north too. And so we'll talk about those. But managing, understanding, making policy for 
New England forest is really complicated when you have more than 600,000 individual landowners with more than 200,000 who own more than 10 acres. You know, each one of these people are making decisions about their forests around kitchen tables. They're not making their decisions largely based on long-term management plans and long-term silvicultural decisions. They're making decisions based on tuition bills and funerals and divorces and, and turnover and new jobs. And, you know, the um, Odom called it the tyranny of small decisions, which is, uh, I really think of it, it, it's just such a different context to think about landscape scale management and, you know, managing for climate and other things in a place with this many different landowners. Landowners can do three things uh, at least. Well, really they can do four. Uh, the first thing they can do that I didn't list is nothing. And I, I, I really shouldn't undervalue that. Most of our landscape has trees that are over 100 years old and they only got there by 100 years of somebody not doing anything to them. So we should appreciate all the times that people didn't manage their forest. But I'll talk about the things that I have good maps for anyway, which is the um, decisions to harvest and its impact, decisions to protect land or to convert land. I'm gonna um, go quickly because I've already, I'm five minutes behind where I'm supposed to be. So I just wanna point out that while harvesting is not a huge part of the New England or of the Massachusetts economy, it's still the largest cause of mature tree mortality than, and bigger than all other sources combined, bigger than wind, which is pretty impressive, right? And this is just based on inventory data. I don't think that's a bad thing. I'm, I, you know, I live in a house made of wood, and I, I think very highly of forestry and foresters. But as an ecological perspective, it's important to think of the, the important role that forestry and timber harvest has in our landscape, driving um, the condition of the forest. And you can see that that happens a heck of a lot more in northern New England, right? Harvesting is a partial disturbance. This isn't Oregon. When I worked in Oregon, we, it was pretty simple. We, we clear cut our dug fir in 110 acre blocks. Here, it's much more complicated. The average timber harvest in Massachusetts removes just 15% of the basal area or the biomass there. This is if you include every time that somebody you know, goes into the woods for firewood. This isn't just commercial harvest. This is anywhere that people are harvesting trees. And so that really affects the composition of the forest. When we try to understand the probability that someone will harvest, of course, that probability goes up the more wood is, there is on the landscape. But knowing who owns the forest is really what drives the probability. So you can see that red and blue line up top. Those are the private forests, corporate and family forests. The probability that they'll harvest at all isn't all that different. Right, The public lands, the probability that they'll harvest, green and yellow at the bottom there, um, is much lower than the private lands. And while there wasn't a huge difference between corporate and family forest owners in terms of whether they'll enter the forest and cut anything, there is a pretty big difference in how much wood they'll take. So you can see on corporate lands, on average, they take more than half of the wood whereas it's just 30% on average on the family forest lands, which is largely what we have here in Massachusetts. There's some exceptions to that, but largely what we're dealing with is uh, family forest owners. And you can see that play out if we just look at a map of where biomass is removed for harvest throughout New England. You can see it's just much more abundant in the North. I've been working on a really cool project lately led by Valerie Pasquarella, who is a remote sensing scientist and uh, we're able to map every timber harvest, every single one and every 30 meter pixel going back four decades. And to me, that's just an impressive picture to see how much harvest there's been in Maine. Uh, the other thing that maybe you notice is that there's a hole in the middle and we'll talk about that hole later, but those of you who have ever climbed Katahdin know what that hole is, right? Uh, but we'll get there. So my takeaways, it may sound like I'm beating up on harvesting. I am not. I just want to emphasize that I couldn't be more pro forestry. I'm just pro smart forestry, good forestry, and there's uh, a lot of bad forestry going on. I think there are massive opportunities for smart forestry and local wood. I can only wish people got as excited about local wood as they did local food. I never see two by fours at the farmer's market, and I find that hugely frustrating. I wish um, we had that same 
same sort of ethic around foresters and forestry uh, that we seem to have uh, developed for farmers, which I, which I love. Harvesting is the most important ecological disturbance. So while it's important as a commodity, it's really important to the condition of our forest. And I'll just say corporate harvest regimes are unsustainable in the North. And I'm willing to go to bat on that statement and if anybody wants to uh, argue with me on it. Sustainability is a, is a word that's sort of squishy around the edges. So um, kind of depends on what you mean. So let's talk about land conversion now. Well, how am I doing? Oh boy. Uh, so we're into this part of the graph where we're now losing forest in all uh, six New England states. Depends on how you measure it, right? What's a forest? So how do you measure forest loss? But if you just use the, um, the FIA, the inventory statistics, you'd estimate that we're losing 30,000 acres of forest each year to development. That's primarily residential development, but it's increasingly energy development. That includes utility scale solar, that includes pipelines, that includes wind, um, which is a new, a new issue because those are happening not in the way we've grown accustomed to with the sort of uh, suburban forest loss and the, the, um, the sort of sprawl frontier that we've, that we've been thinking about for a long time. 40% of all the forest loss in New England occurs in Massachusetts, which given that it's about 10% of New England, that's a sort of shocking number. But as severe as that is, if you just think of it in terms of the biomass removed when you're gonna build a house or you're gonna harvest for timber, it's way more bio woody biomass leaving for forestry. That said, when you, Cut, when you convert forest to non-forest, the forests don't grow back. And in a forestry situation, they do. We'll talk about a, a little about the long-term ramifications of this, but if you just spin this out um, to using the recent trends of forest loss, and uh, you can see that you'd move from eight to 12 over the next uh, 50 years. Not, and this one, I, put, I regret putting this one in because I, I needed talk more about it, and I don't think I have time anymore, but we can talk about this later. I'll take a minute on this one, though. So this is that same simulation model, right? And what this shows first is, so that's the landscape potential for accumulating carbon. So we can gain about 55% more carbon by the year 2060. If, you know, it's a model, I can just take the people out. It's a computer model. It's pretty easy to do. You didn't have to convince anybody. Uh, so we can see in the dashed line, that brown line is different from the solid brown line. And the difference between those two is climate change. This is sort of the enhancement associated with longer growing seasons and carbon dioxide. And so you can see that actually increases the carbon stored in the forest. I'll say a lot of that's driven in this model by carbon dioxide and a lot of what we know about carbon dioxide scientifically at these super high concentrations is still a little tenuous. So I wouldn't hang my hat too much on that difference. When we look at the effect of all land use together, this is the difference, right? About 16% less carbon in the forest. 12% of that loss comes from harvesting, right? Another four from conversion. So harvesting has a big impact on our, though most of that, almost 70% is from May, right? The harvesting. I don't, I'm gonna um, leave that there. I, but I wanna make the point that forest loss isn't just about the forests that are lost. Fragmentation is also reshaping the forests that remain. We find the conditions within 20 meters up to 30 meters along a forest edge are just the, the microenvironments totally different. They're more subject to wind, drought, fire, the light conditions are different, the nitrogen is different. And so you might say, okay, well, that's just right along the edges. That's no big deal. Well, in Massachusetts, there's a heck of a lot of forest edges. So here, the, look at the bottom ones. The red, those are forests within 20 meters of an edge where we know the conditions are totally different, right? So in Boston, it's more than 80% of the forests are within 20 meters of an edge. So it's really very little of anything you could think of as an interior forest. And as you move to Concord, it's about 45% of the forest is within. Uh, good old Peter Sam, though, 
down around 10% near an edge. So we'll take that. But overall, the whole state of Massachusetts, 23% of the forest, almost a quarter of the forest are within 20 meters of an edge. And we're really just beginning to understand how different those ecosystems are because we've spent our whole scientific endeavor trying to get deep enough into the forest to start measuring them. And very few people have measured the differences in conditions along the edges. Okay, I'm gonna talk about land protection now, okay? And here, uh, what do I mean? Well, in New England, it's about, it's 24% of the forest. That's a big number, I think. I would like to see it about tripled, but it's still a pretty big number of the landscape is protected from development, right? That doesn't mean you can't do other things in the forest. Indeed, often, uh, you know, the probability of harvesting goes up if land's been protected for some pretty good reason. New England, uh, New Hampshire has the most protected land, but they're cheating because they have the White Mountain National Forest. And I don't think that should be allowed. So I, I give the prize to Massachusetts because we end up with almost 30 without any big chunk of federal land like the whites or the greens. You know, Maine uh, also has a lot of protected land. We'll talk about that. You know, Maine is 51% of New England. So when you have 20% of Maine, that's quite a lot of land there. Half of the land protected is public and half is private. So what do I mean by private protected land? So this is largely easements, conservation easements. There are more land trusts in New England than there are in the rest of the United States combined. Um, and the other half is public. So that's state land, federal land, municipal land, right? Much of the growth in land protection, 70% of all land protected in the past 30 years is private. Right. You know, this kind of knocked me out when I first did the math. Half of more than half of all the land protected in New England has been protected since 1990. When I started thinking about this, you know, land protection was like Teddy Roosevelt did that or the Weeks Act did that. And it all happened a long time ago. But that's not true. You know, land protection is a super important part of the modern land use regime. And the decisions we're making about land protection are going to affect generations. The thing um, that I find really interesting about this is, so this is how much has been protected each year. And I'll just say, note those big spikes in the middle, right? And so what's going on there? That's since 1990. Well, I just said half of all land protected has been protected since 1990. Well, half of that, that dark green bar at the top, that is 17,000 different land deals throughout New England, right? Those are every little land trust deal, every municipal. And then 27% of it, what I'm calling large protected timberland, it's about 31. 17,000 and 31, you know? So what the heck are those 31 deals? I'm super interested in those. So they're largely up north, though you can see that there's one in Massachusetts, that's Paul C. Jones. And then there's one uh, Hull Land in Connecticut, but largely they're in Maine. So let's focus on those for a minute. So what, what are these large protected timberlands? I'm gonna get a little soapboxy on you for a minute. These are lands that are protected from development. They are owned by financial companies, largely, Timos and REITs. There's very little traditional vertically integrated timber companies anymore in Maine, you know, the kind that own the mill and they own the land and they have this steady supply of timber. These are, this is Fidelity, Hancock, GMO. These are, uh, we all have these in our mutual funds, whether we know it or not, right? And so they get paid hundreds of millions of dollars to put easements on their land to sell the development rights so that nobody builds anything on them. Well, I put up the map of development threat next to the map of the large protected timberlands, and it's my contention that these are not protected from what they're threatened by. Remember that map I showed you before where we mapped every single timber harvest for the past 40 years? Well, here it is again. And on the right side is Baxter State Park. That's the hole we were talking about before. On the left side is a conservation easement. So I don't know, that seems like a lot of harvest for the conservation easement. Some of that harvest happened before the easement went into play. And to be fair, the easement didn't say anything about timber harvesting. It's not illegal, 
In fact, some of the easements were, you know, designed to bolster economies and not ecologies. But when I tell you that 25% of New England is protected, I think we all have an image of what that means. And I'm not sure this is really what that image is. And so I'm nervous about this research because much of this is coming from the Forest Legacy Program, which is the largest single source of conservation funding in the US. I support conservation investments. I just think in this case, it is being mismanaged and financial companies are having a windfall uh, and we're not seeing much ecological benefit for those conservation easements. Doesn't have to be that way. You can write an easement any way you want. In fact, I don't have much good to say about Apple as a company. This is, you know, your phone and your laptop. But um, in this case, I'll say something nice. They put an easement on this land called Reed Plantation, which is in Maine. And I've read the easement. In fact, I've read every one of these easements. And in this case, because they are doing this to have sustainably harvested packaging for their iPhones or whatever, uh, the easement language requires a rest period. It requires growth. It has riparian buffers. It still allows a lot of forestry. The idea is to supply packaging, you know, and it just goes to show me, and they got, uh, no, there was no forest legacy money on this one, but it goes to show that those easements could be written in a way that they'd be protected from what they're threatened by. I'm going to shift gears a little bit, uh, and I'm on to my, really my last topic here. <clears throat> which is a new line of research where we're looking at the environmental justice um, criteria for land conservation, uh, where we asked three questions. We came into this, we looked at that map and we said, are there disparities in the access to protected open space by factors of social marginalization? <clears throat> Excuse me, this is a long time just to talk at your computer. How can we incorporate those criteria uh, into priorities for new land protection? And how, if we did that, would it change the focus? And so just really quickly, we can say, first, what you see here is if you see this total on the left, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but you can see here households and census tracts in the lowest income quartile have about half as much available protected land as those in the highest quartile. Similarly, communities with the highest proportion of people of color have about 60% as much nearby protected land. Now you might be thinking, well, that's just because the protected lands in the rural landscape and the EJ communities are in the urban landscape, but that's not true. We looked at this individually by urban, ex-urban and rural, and these patterns hold. These patterns hold for new and old land protection. And so I'm not saying that I think every land protection deal should be done to meet environmental justice constraints. If you want to protect lynx habitat, it ought not be near any communities. It ought to be as remote as you can get it. But there's a lot of public investment towards um, protecting land. And I think all of the public ought to see some benefit from that public investment. And so I would just like this to become one of the criteria that conservation organizations consider as they're prioritizing land. With that in mind, we asked ourselves, how would that change land protection? And so we looked at it as compared to things like long-term resilience, which is the TNC's uh, uh, climate change resilience layer, drinking water importance and carbon stocks. And I mean, the take home there is that the EJ criteria align better with some uh, conventional criteria like drinking water than they do with others like climate resilience. And that if you did adopt the focus on environmental justice, the criteria would substantially shift their priorities for new protection. And I've been really encouraged at how many uh, conservation groups have wanted to hear about this work. We made a web map so that you can explore it. If you're interested in getting access to that web map that aligns where protected areas are and where EJ communities are, shoot me an email and we'll get you a link to that. It's free for anybody to use. So great strides in protecting New England, much to be done. Let's get that number up around 70%, I'd say. And uh, we just need to better match the protections with both the people who benefit and the threats to that land, right? And so as we think about all this in the past, we're gonna say, but wait, the past is a poor predictor of future results. And so as I use these simulation models and write these conservation plans, uh, 
we try to find ways to consider things like biomass energy and carbon offsets and crazy politics and, and solar uh, utility scale solar and all the insects. And I don't have time to go into it, but I hope maybe somebody will be interested because we did this big four year project to look at alternative scenarios. And so here you can see these four scenarios that are different in terms of what we assume about socioeconomic connectedness into the future and natural resource planning and innovation. And we worked with hundreds of stakeholders throughout New England. They articulated these scenarios and then we built them into these simulation models, right? And so we could explore all these different variables. And now we have looked at how the future is different in terms of carbon, landscape protection, maple syrup, wildlife habitat. And if you're interested in this stuff, I'm out of time, so I can't spend more on it, but I encourage you to go to www.newenglandlandscapes.org. I don't know why that's not written here. It's supposed to be in big blue. It's not there. Newenglandlandscapes.org. That's not too hard to remember. And then you'll be able to explore these four scenarios yourself, and you'll have a little interactive slider, and you can pick your town or your county and look at how these different scenarios play out over the next 50 years there. And so... Uh, I hope some of you will check that out. And if you want any of the data, we make it all freely available and you can analyze it however you want. So that's all I got for you. This work that I presented is the, you know, I did just like 1% of it. I, my lab is incredible. I have incredible collaborators and I really appreciate your time um, listening. I hope, I hope this was useful. Hey, Jonathan, we're, we're still all here and it's been amazing. Okay, good. I've just There's been on my laptop for 45 minutes. So much you've been uh, covering. Um, we do have a- So should I stop sharing? Yeah, like that would this? be great. Um, we do have a okay. few questions coming up. They're coming up fast now. Um, and a Any lot of- Any way you want to do this, we can do it. Um, we've had a lot of likes. We had some initial appreciation of your consideration for the Nipmuc people at the beginning. And I love how you came back to environmental justice at the end. Um, so let me see, uh, look at a couple of the questions here. Um, it says, thank you for this lecture. As forests have regenerated in New England, are there estimates for their biodiversity compared to historical ecosystems in the region? Um, yeah, there has been a lot of work on biodiversity. I'm not, um, I'm not the best person to speak of it. It's interesting, you know, uh, sometimes I show this graph of like the return of wildlife. I made joked about Thoreau not seeing the deer and of course now, um, we all just worry we're going to run into one. And so the landscape has really changed and some, the, some of the diversity associated with open lands now has become priorities for some conservation like bobolinks or things like that. And we have moose bath. The, um, you know, the tree diversity, we just studied that, I think mostly about trees. And I can say, and sort of surprisingly, and uh, to me, it makes a good point about biodiversity is, the, the communities for which have the highest um, agricultural history, like that peak in the agricultural census, if you had more, you have greater tree diversity today than uh, areas that had less agriculture. And really all that says is when you have a diversity of habitats, you get a diversity of species. And um, so that's not a great answer. If you send me an email, I'll send you a neat, a paper that looks at wildlife perspectives and tree perspectives on biodiversity and how that's changed. Okay, great. Um, there's another question here about, um, do you have any data on foreign ownership of New England forests? Foreign, like non-American. Um, no, I don't have that data. I'll tell you though, I said I read every one of those easements. Uh, most of those lands up north seem to be owned by LLCs in Delaware. And that's because these big financial companies obfuscate their ownership and you can't even tell who owns them and they're sort of hidden behind corporate muckery. I'm out of my um, depth to say, you know, but it's, it's lawyers layered on corporate owns. So okay. no, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Sounds like it's not an easy one to answer. Yeah. Um, 
Let's see, here's a long question. I haven't read it yet, but here it goes. Has there been any attempt to quantify the rights of owners of protected lands, AKA in the breakdown of the protected land, what are the different protections that are covered? I used to work for a land trust and it would be interesting to see what percents are fully protected like wilderness land or require a forest management plan or more stringent forestry rules or have no requirement of a forest management plan, possibly of some conversion either to agriculture or subdivided built upon. It's a great question and the answer is yes. And we work on that a lot. And sometimes I show this neat figure where we, we actually read 500 randomly selected easements and coded what the protections were because each easement is written individually for each piece of land, right? And so, um, what, so anyway, the, the answer to that is it varies wildly what it means to be protected. Um, the specific question about wilderness land or what are sometimes called forever wild easements or gap one or gap two or whatever you want to call it. So uh, David Foster, Emily Johnson and Brian Hall just completed a near census of those for New England and they're going to be releasing a report on that in the next couple months. I hate to steal their punchline but I will. It comes out to about three percent of the landscape has uh, wilderness protection by the strict criteria. And they did this by contacting everybody they could. So it was a real grassroots effort to figure it out. You know, it constitutes about 9% of the protected land total, I think. And, um, but it's, it's really interesting. And there's a lot more in Massachusetts than I knew about. And they made a cool interactive map. So stay tuned for that because you can, you can explore around and see where the, the um, forever wild easements are. Okay, awesome. I didn't. I didn't know that. Um, I'm going to give you one more question here, and then anyone else who wants to um, can either send an email to Jonathan directly or send it through me, and I can forward it on to him. Um, I'm not sure we've put up your email, Jonathan. Uh, I'll put it right in the chat here, and and I see Joe is on on, and he kindly put the New England Landscapes uh, um, URL up there too. So, but I'll write my okay. email here in the chat and I welcome your questions. Um, so one more here. On a recent walk through Otter River State Forest, I was wondering how forests with silviculture do next to unattended forests in regard to disease and invasives, both um, invasive insects and invasive plants. So there's no one answer because invasives are take all shapes and sizes, right? I'll tell you like hemlock willy adelgid, that thing, that little bug is the size of the period at the end of a sentence. It reproduces asexually and flies on the wind. Oh, my dog came to visit. <laughs> um, and so there's, it doesn't really matter. Like the hemlock, you cannot keep the adelgid off the hemlock. Um, gypsy moth, or sorry, Lymantra, we're, the name's been, we're not calling it gypsy moth anymore. The, um, there, if oak density is really high, the, the moth has an easier time spreading. And so, sorry, the dog. Um, so in that case, silviculture can limit the spread of Lymantra. Um, so it, it really depends on what you're talking about. Like garlic mustard loves disturbance and so often shows up after harvest. Invasive plants in particular, uh, tend to co-occur with uh, disturbance. And so plants are different than the insects. Sometimes trees are stressed and they are more affected by insects. So thinning the forest can make the trees less stressed because they have more light and more resources. And so they're much better capable of dealing with insect stress in a silviculture situation. That's a long-winded way of saying it depends, I guess. Mm, but with interesting examples, um... Well, I wanna thank everybody for coming today um, and remind you that we will have this recording on our website. Um, I wanna invite you to come to our first forest walk in East Brookfield next week, if you're available. And that's also up on our website. And if anyone does wanna stay and ask more questions, I think we can stay for 10 or 15 more minutes. Yeah, um, I'm happy to.
I see mm -hmm. Colin asked about the percent. Well, thanks everybody. Please go do whatever you're doing. Um, but happy to chat. Yeah. Uh, what is my website? Is I would just Google Harvard Forest and then go to my name, Jonathan Thompson. I don't actually know. Like you have to kind of drill down through it. So we have met, we have all these edge plots. This is the question about forest edges um, on this transect from Boston to Petersham, and we measure the heck out of them on just you know they're uh, 50 meters along the edge, and then they go into the forest. Our early ones went 100 meters, and now we know that there's no sense in going in 100 meters. And we really see that by the time you're 20 meters in from an open landscape, the light can conditions and the microclimatic conditions are pretty much the same as if you're 100 meters in. So that's why I kept stressing the 20 meters. You know, interesting, we find a lot more growth, a lot more carbon sequestration on the edges. I know that feels weird because fragmentation is generally not seen as a good thing, and I agree with that. But in fact, just the extra light you get from having side light coming in on the forest results in a lot higher tree growth and about 60% higher tree growth, as a matter of fact. Yeah. And so the, it's a real interesting kind of small mitigation. It in no way compensates for the carbon that was lost when you like fragmented the forest. But um, anyway, that, mm -hmm. I hope I answered the question on the edges. There's another one coming in. Um, it says, forest fragmentation is affecting the health of forests in the context of mother tree information, right? Yeah. And is there a minimum area to maintain healthy diversity? And I don't know what yeah. they mean by mother so the tree. Mother tree is Simard's work, and this relates to the um, symbiotic associations below ground in which trees, um, depending on how you think about it, um, but the way Simard thinks of it is that they communicate and can protect each other and work together through through this symbiosis of shared, this fungal network below ground. Um, so yes, fragmentation would affect that in so much as it breaks up the ability for these fungal networks to be connected. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not so good in the below ground uh, side, particularly in the fungal work. I work with a brilliant scientist, Sarita Fry at the University of New Hampshire, who's just um, the best in terms of this. So I would point to her for questions. Um, and is there a minimum area to maintain healthy diversity? You know, you put your quote, quotes around healthy and I feel the same way, like I don't know what that means. What I can say though is, you know, we've looked at forest fragments a lot and the small fragments of forest really, you know, they punch above their weight in terms of what they provide a community and what they provide wildlife. And so while they may not be uh, able to do all the things that a big intact forest does, the things they are do are so remarkable given the small fragments. So I have just a lot of respect for the backyard forests and little patches of neglected forest, even when they're wrapped up by bittersweet and everything else. They often provide shade and habitat and species and, and you know, water filtration and, and green on your eyes and all these things that we need. So uh, I wouldn't discount them. Uh, Jonathan, mm -hmm. please keep coming. Um, thank you so much. And so many interesting lines of inquiry here. I discovered woolly adelgid on my trees and then on neighborhood walk on other, others on adjacent properties. All the trees appear to a novice otherwise healthy. Is there an effective treatment? So there is um, insecticide treatments that you can use. They're expensive and they need to be reapplied. So they're not tenable in a sort of landscape context. But if you had like a beautiful hemlock in your yard or whatever, and you wanted to protect it, but they inject the insecticide into the ground and into the tree. And so it, it probably has um, other impacts on it. It is not my specialty. So you should talk to your extension agent about that. I don't know or uh, Dave Orwig at the forest is good. The uh, adelgid, what you tend to see, because they're so small, is the wool that they put on. And you can often see them in, in March is the easy time to see it. And um, the, the sort of stochastic nature, the fact that it's here and not there and over here, we can't figure that out. 
And I think a lot of it's just random. Um, no trees are immune. It often takes 20 plus years to kill a tree from a delgid, particularly, you know, it, it's something, I'll get this wrong and forgive me if there's any like true entomologists on the call, but I think it's negative 25 degrees C, one night of negative 25 degrees Celsius kills 95% of the adelgid. And so this sets them back, right? It never kills them all. And because of the way it moves and the, because it reproduces asexually, um, you'll never get them back, but you keep knocking it back. And so that's why for a long time, Massachusetts was the Northern range extent of hemlock woolly adelgid. Not anymore. Uh, climate change has made the frequency of these cold nights much rarer. And so um, there's now adelgid all the way up into Ontario. And the uh, Eastern hemlock is um, sadly, um, you know, going to be extinct, I'd say, in probably 50 years. And I don't think there's anything we can do about it. And it's a tree unlike any other. It is, it is the most shade tolerant tree. It shades 70% of riparian areas in Massachusetts. So its impact on freshwater fisheries is unparalleled. It provides thermal refugia for all sorts of wildlife. We've all seen those little crevices under the hemlock right in the forest. There's a little area with no snow under there that the wildlife depend on. You know, it's getting replaced by um, black birch, which is like, if there's a less charismatic tree than black birch, I, I mean, they taste like wintergreen. I guess they got that going for them, but otherwise I don't have much good to say about it and certainly doesn't have the same ecological niche, so. I don't see any more questions coming up, but I have a question for you, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a sense of what um, forestry regulations are like in Massachusetts in terms of protecting um, endangered species and wetland areas. How, what kind of um, policy for harvest management is there in the other New England states? Is it similar or is it all radically different? It's, it's different. There are forest um, practices and in each state. Maine had a radical change in the uh, early 2000s that have had a lot of unintended consequences. You know, they outlawed clear cutting and um, that sounds like a good idea on its face, um, but they they then went to what's called corduroy in many cases where they're just cutting strips and then coming back and getting the other strips but the shade from the remaining strips means the regeneration doesn't come back and you just have all these sort of corduroy and it's like twice as much like damage from the uh, machines and the roads and everything else. And so it's one of these cases where the best of intentions um, maybe haven't played out the way folks thought. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not super familiar with the forest practice laws in every state, so I can't speak to them everywhere though. Um, Maine and Massachusetts have the most um, well-articulated laws, I can say that. Thank you. All right, well, thanks everyone for coming. I'm gonna yeah. end the 